Hey there, this is Dan Bader. And in this video tutorial, you're going to learn how to use the PyLint linter for Python. So you might be wondering what is actually a code linter. So a code linter is a program that inspects your Python code. And essentially, it gives you feedback on your Python code. So the linter will inspect, for example, um, this file over here. So I've got some example file that is kind of iffy. It's not great Python code. There's some formatting issues. Um, some common issues are in there. For example, I'm not using some of the variables I'm declaring here. And it's it could be improved. You know, let's just keep it at that. And so a linter is a program that can identify these issues and tell you how to resolve them in, in a fully automated way. So it's essentially, it's almost like a robot tutor for your Python programs. And the great thing is, because a linter is a program, uh, you can just constantly run in the background, or you can run it when you run your automated tests or when your team runs your automated tests. So it's a great way to ensure a certain minimum quality standard when it comes to your Python code or the Python code of your team or your whole company. So it's a really, really great tool. There are a number of linters available for Python. In this tutorial, I'm going to talk about PyLint and show you how to set it up and how to install it. And there are some other linters that I would also recommend. My personal favorite is called Flake8. And I've got uh, another video on that that will show you how to set this up. And that also has some more background on code linting in Python. And that'll be linked in the description and also on that little info button in the upper right. So you can check that out. Today, I want to show you how to install PyLint. Uh, PyLint is a really well known linter for Python, like I said earlier. So PyLint has a number of very useful features. Number one, it can check your Python code for compliance with the PEP8 style guide, which is a very common style guide that's often used on Python projects. So I would highly recommend that you learn more about it. And PyLint can help you uh, make sure that the Python code it runs on actually follows the PEP8 style guide. But uh, PyLint can also find and tell you about certain classes of errors that might be in your code. Um, you know, things like unused variables, stuff, stuff that I mentioned before. And um, it, it has some more like really interesting features. For example, it can also generate UML di diagrams. And um, it is very customizable in general. That's actually, I think that's one of the downsides of PyLint. Uh, or potential downsides of PyLint that there's a huge number of settings you can play with. So it might take you a while to find the optimum setting. But once you've got it set up well, or you're just you know running with the, the default configuration, which is also a viable option, then it's a really great tool that provides you with a lot of helpful feedback and will help you write better code and cleaner Python code. All right, so I'm going to show you how to set up PyLint now. So in this case, I've got this little example file here. And um, it doesn't look great, right? It's uh, sort of not very good Python code. There are some unused or there's an unused variable here. The naming is kind of off. The formatting is off. And we're going to take that as an example to see what PyLint can do with this file. And so over here, I've got a virtual environment set up because generally I recommend that you install any sort of Python tool, any sort of Python dependency into a virtual environment. And I've got a, a longer in-depth course on that if you're interested, but it's not really in the scope of this tutorial. So here you can see um, I've got this example file here in this directory that I'm in right now. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to install PyLint. So PyLint is just a Python module essentially that you that you install. So you can install it through pip or conda or pretty much any package manager you would want to use. And I'm just going to go ahead and install the PyLint module now, which also includes a, a command line tool that's called PyLint. And this will also be set up now. All right, so now I've installed it. And we can just make sure that PyLint is actually installed and it's available here. We just run PyLint by itself or on its own. Then you're going to get a bunch of helpful uh, information on how to use the program. As you can see here, PyLint is pretty extensive uh, when it comes to its configuration. So Kind of the minimal example for using PyLint is to simply pass it a Python file. And that actually gets you very, very far. So in this case, I'm going to go PyLint space example.py. And 
I'm going to run pylint on this example file. All right, so this took a short moment, and now we can see all of the feedback that pylint has for this particular code that you can see here on the left. So in this case, it actually dug up some interesting stuff. So essentially, you get several columns here. So in the first column, you can see the type of error or problem that was identified or the type of feedback that pylint found. In this case, C will stand for code style, and then we've got uh, W for warning and these different types. Uh, some of them will actually be errors where the Python pro program wouldn't work, but um, I guess you could also find that out in a different way. Um, and yeah, here, the second column, it tells you where this problem is located. Now, uh, just a word of, well, not really a word of warning, but just some, uh, some tip here. With these, obviously, this is kind of hard to go back and forth and identify this feedback, you know, like based on the line numbers that get printed out. But there's a way you can integrate pylint feedback into your editor, which again, I also highly recommend that you do that. If you want to do that with Sublime Text, I've got a whole course that shows you how to set up a really awesome and productive um, setup for Sublime Text that includes Pylint integration and Flake 8 integration. So um, you might want to check that out. But basically, you want the Sublime Linter plugin and then the Pylint plugin to get that up and running on Sublime Text. All right, so now back to the feedback we got here in our code. Um, then here in the next column, you can actually see what it's talking about. So here, Pylint says, okay, so there's a code style, piece of code style feedback in line six, which is over here. And we have, we're lacking a space. And that's true, right? Like when you check over here, or it actually also prints that out with this um, kind of inline example here. So this is a bad white space error, and we're lacking a space character here. And uh, now I fix that. And when I run pylint again, we don't get that error message anymore. We don't get that warning anymore. And the other thing you can see here is that at the end, pylint will always print out a score for your code, which is, you know, some, I guess, arbitrary metric that goes from, uh, I don't actually know from, you know, what the range is, but I think it goes up to 10 where like 10 is perfect and like minus 10 is the worst or I don't know, you know, it's like some negative is bad and then the higher you go, the better it is. And you can see here that now it's actually a little bit better. It's still negative, but it's we're, we're doing a little bit better because we fixed that one issue. Now, you know, with any of these metrics, um, I'd be careful because it's, it's very hard to put a an accurate metric on any kind of code or program that, you know, that that, that gives you valid, like valid feedback. Um, it's very, people try that all the time. And I see that, you know, when development teams, someone comes in, like a manager comes in, they're like, okay, we're going to focus on code quality now. You know, we, need, we have this one metric and um, that we want that to always go up. And then essentially what happens is that people start optimizing for that metric. And you can still write programs that don't actually have any value, have no business value whatsoever, but they have like really great metrics. So, you know, always, this is always to be taken with a grain of salt. But that said, it's still a helpful metric because it's like a little game, right? You want to make the numbers go up in this case. So I really like using linters because partly because of that sort of gamification aspect, I guess, because, you know, you always have some number that can you can make go up and, and kind of improve and, and make better. And um, that makes me feel good. Now, you know, you always want to keep in the back of your mind that this number is maybe not that meaningful after all. But, um, you know, still, like when, when you look at this here, this is all very valid and helpful feed, feedback. And like, obviously, you know, to tell you the truth, like I set this example up so that we would get some helpful feedback and um, actually have something to do. All right. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over these, um, this pylinter or pylint feedback here. And I'm just going to fix these issues. So again, we have another code style issue here in line 12. And then we've got a missing module doc string here. So let's just turn that into a doc string. And at any time, you can just rerun pylint, right? So this is there's no harm in that. It's not going to execute your program. It's not going to do anything. It's just going to inspect your code. All right, so invalid class name car. So I think that's also interesting because, again, here what we want is an uppercase class name for this class if we want to follow the PEP8 style guide. And that's a very good recommendation, right? So now what you're going to see in a minute, or I guess in a second, 
is that when I run this, and now we should actually get a new problem that tells me that car isn't defined, right? Because now car doesn't exist anymore. Like I just renamed the class from lowercase car to uppercase car, or like, um, like it starts with, with an uppercase character now. And now this code is broken. And Pylint told, told me about this, which, um, which is kind of nice. All right, so now the code is actually terrible, right? Like now our score is really bad because we have, um, uh, I guess we have some critical error in here that means the program wouldn't actually run. So we have like a real error here. It's not a warning, it's a real error. All right, so let's run this again. Okay, missing class doc string. All right, I'm just gonna put uh, a terrible doc string here. Example class, right? It's not a real a good doc, doc string. Okay, now now we're getting into some territory. So here, let, let me refresh this. We're getting into, into some territory where um, this is very sort of subjective feedback, right? So now it's telling us that, hey, this class doesn't doesn't have enough public methods. And um, and I mean, that's true, but then we're sort of, you know, this might still make sense given the context of the program. So PyLint is very opinionated in that sense. And it's going to tell you, it's going to point out some things that you might disagree with. And that's where it's important to look into how to suppress some of these so that you can kind of tweak it and tune it to your liking, right? If you're doing this intentionally, then you might not want to see that error. And to a certain degree, that's why I prefer Flake 8, because Flake 8 is only pointing out code style issues and things that are just not a good idea to do, right? Like it's not going to tell you, hey, um, you didn't define enough public methods on, on a class, but it's going to it's going to tell you that, you know, you made a for formatting mistake or um, you, uh, you're doing something that is not recommended. Like for example, comparing to uh, to um, to none with the double equals operator versus the is operator and, and stuff like that, right? So it's going to point out these things that are that should just be changed. And PyLint does that too, but it also adds stuff um, like this sort of subjective code feedback. And you know, this might be a good thing, might be a bad thing. Like actually, I think for someone who's st just starting out to write Python or they want to get better at their Python, um, it can be a very helpful thing. So. I, I actually used PyLint a lot in the past and in, oh, since the last couple of years, I switched over to Flake 8 for that, pretty much that reason. So you can always run both too, right? And that's always a possibility. Anyway, so let's fix some of the remaining stuff here. Okay, I've got uh, invalid constant, my car. Okay, because we're not using that for anything, right? Because... Oh, wait, we are. Okay, so this is actually, so this, in this case, because this is like a top level constant, we would want this to be uppercase, which again, you know, this is something you, you might disagree with. But um, let's just fix all of the things that PyLint pointed out here. Okay, missing function doc string. An example function. Okay, we did that. So now this is telling us about a missing or unused argument in this function definition here. Um, you know, as you can see here, we defined car2, but we're, we're never really using it in the function. And uh, again, this might be intentional or this might not be intentional. And um, this is a good example to show you how we can suppress these errors in PyLint as well. All right, so what you can do in this case is you can add a hint for PyLint and, and that usually uh, takes the form of a, a Python Python comment. So in this case, you could go pylint colon, and then you can go disable equals, and then you want to put the error message or the error type that we saw here. So in this case, it will be unused argument. So I want to suppress that. And um, I'm going to zoom out for a minute so you can see what this looks like. Um, so that's that's the hint for the py, pylint executable. So now when I lint this code again, it uh, it ignored this error, and actually here we're going to ignore this other error as well, right? And we're going to put that on the whole class. Disable equals boom, and now okay, we did great, right? We suppressed a bunch of errors, and now our code is perfect.
just perfect Python code. Um, I mean, that's obviously like not how this works. And you can, you may or may not like how these uh, PyLint uh, hints or annotations, how they're cluttering up your code. So the other route you can go, um, you can create a PyLint RC file that stores some of these settings per project or even globally. And that makes it a lot easier to manage them. You can add that to your source repository for a project. And uh, that way you can control how PyLint checks your code and the feedback it gives you. But, you know, in summary, this is how you use PyLint. You just pip install it and you can fire away. It's a command line tool. So that means you can run it on your tests. You can run it as part of a build script or, um, you know, it, you can run that in any way you like. And um, it, is, it is a great tool. It's going to give you a lot of valuable feedback on your Python code. There are other tools just like it. Uh, in general, these tools are called static analysis tools. And I would highly recommend that you start learning about these tools and start using these tools because they can give you a lot of valuable feedback on your Python code. Actually, I just noticed something. So here, I'm not sure why this wasn't called out, but um, did you see that? I had some extra spaces here. And so I'm not sure why PyLint didn't call that out because it looked kind of, it looked like it would actually um, violate the coding guidelines here, the code style guidelines. So anyway, you know, that, I, I guess that's also an example that shows you that these tools are not perfect, right? That's what I mean. Like now we've got supposedly perfect code quality, but of course we've got to take that with a grain of salt because I mean, it's not a, like this is actually a useless program, right? So this doesn't really do anything interesting. So um, just wanted to mention that again, right? Because it's very easy to kind of go that route where it's like, oh yeah, we just need to make all the metrics go up and then we'll write the perfect programs will be that much more productive. Generally, that's not true. Nevertheless, please use these tools. Like I'm, you can see this, but right now I'm doing the double thumbs up here in front of my computer as I'm recording this because they are great. Try and integrate them into your editing environment you know, whether you're using PyCharm or Sublime or Atom or Vim or Emacs, they all have tools and plugins that allow you to get this feedback straight in your editor. And it is very, very useful. It's very, very helpful. Um, I've disabled that for this, uh, this video here in my editor because I wanted to show you kind of the, the bare bones kind of manual approach with the command line. But um, in general, I would encourage you to actually pull that feedback into your IDE or your Python editor. All right, well, I hope this was useful. So happy Pythoning, and I'll talk to you soon. If you enjoyed this video, click the subscribe button in the lower right. Cheers.